In this lecture, we're going to cover what's called the chi-square test of independence. So first we'll start with an overview of what the chi-square test of independence is, the statistical assumptions that underlie it, as well as what statistical and practical significance mean in the context of a chi-square test of independence. So let's start with the overview. So we can describe the association between two variables in different ways, and in this lecture we're going to focus on the association between two categorical variables. In other words, we're really interested in two variables that represent frequencies or counts in different categories. And so specifically, we're going to focus on the chi-square test of independence. So the chi-square test of independence can be used to test whether two categorical variables are independent from each other. Or in other words, we can think about it on the flip side, are they contingent upon each other? Is there an association between these two categorical variables? And so, for example, we might have a two by two chi-square test of independence, and what that means is that we have two categorical variables, and each one of those categorical variables has two levels or categories. Alternatively, for example, we might have a two by five chi-square test of independence, which means, again, we have two categorical variables, but one has two levels or categories, and the other has five levels or categories. Perhaps the most simple one to start with is two by two chi-square test of independence, and that's what we're gonna focus on in this lecture. So let's talk about those statistical assumptions that underlie a chi-square test of independence. So there's really two major assumptions we need to be concerned about. And so the first is that the employees or case cases or observations or whatever your unit of measure is are randomly sampled from the underlying population such that the variable scores for one case are independent of the variable scores of another case or individual or observation. Now the second assumption is that we need to include what are called non-occurrences. And so what are non-occurrences? This would be, for example, if you're interested in counting the number of people who quit um, who were in the new training program versus the old training program, you would also want to also include those non-occurrences, which would be those people who stayed as well. Okay? And so this way we'd fill out, for instance, the two by two chi-square test of independence contingency table. And I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. So let's start with the concept of statistical significance when we're talking about a chi-square test of independence. So using null hypothesis significance testing, we would interpret a p-value that is less than 0.05, or whatever we set our alpha to, to meet the standard for statistical significance, meaning we reject the null hypothesis that the variables are independent of one another. So in other words, we would be concluding that there is some association or that the values or the observations of one variable are contingent upon a, the second variable that we have. Now, if the p-value associated with the chi-square test is equal to or greater than 0.05 or whatever alpha level we set, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis that the variables are independent from one another. In other words, we conclude that they're not contingent upon each other and there doesn't appear to be any association between these two categorical variables. So let's walk through an example of a chi-square test of independence in the context of human resource management training evaluation. So let's suppose that we have a training condition and a no training condition. So in other words, perhaps in our HR information system, we have coded people who attended a training and those people who did not attend the training in a certain time period. And then we also have in our information system those people who quit in that time period and those people who stayed during that time period. And so there's two levels or categories for each one of these variables where the first variable is training or no training, so that's the training condition, and the second one is quit or stayed, which is our turnover variable that we're interested in here. And so let's say, for example, that 18 people who received the training quit, as this contingency table notes here, and then of those people who received the training, 32 stayed. Now regarding those people who did not receive the training, 32 quit, and regarding those people who did not receive the training, 18 stayed. Now another important part of actually building out a contingency table like this is S or is actually calculating the row and column marginals as well as the overall sample size. So the row ma ma marginals are simply, if you add up for each one of the, the variables that appear in, the, in the, the column that is to the left of the table here, so that'd be training versus no training. So if we add up each one of those row values, so let's say starting with the training row there, 18 plus 32 gives us the row marginal of 50. Now for the no training row, 32 plus 18 gives us the row marginal of 50. Now let's look at the columns now, which correspond to that turnover variable of quit versus stayed. So you can see in the first column of quit, 
18 plus 32 equals 50. And for the column that says stayed, 32 plus 18 equals 50. So those are the column marginals. Now, if you look at the far right-hand corner, lower right-hand corner of this contingency table, you will see the total sample size. And so this is the total number of people that are actually in this particular sample that we're going to run the chi-square test of independence on. So this contingency table is referred to as including what are called the observed data. So these are actually what we observe, the actual counts or frequencies that we see in each one of these cells. And because this is a two by two chi-square test of independence, we have four cells that we're interested in. And so that corresponds to training versus no training by quit versus stayed. Now, we also need to calculate, when we're doing a chi-square test of independence, what's referred to as the expected data or the expected observations. And so what that means is, what would we assume by chance would be most likely? Or what is likely if there's no association between or these two variables? In other words, these two variables that are categorical, if they're truly independent of each other, what would we expect? And so here's the expected data that we'd see here. We'd expect 25 people in each one of these cells here. So there's, in other words, there's an equal probability that if you were in the training that you would quit versus stay, and if you weren't in the training that you would quit versus stay as well. But we can also calculate the row marginals here as well, and so it's calculated in the same way you would for the observed data. But now let's take a look at how we calculate these expected values. So in this case, it was pretty easy to calculate them. It was 25 in each one of these cells. But the actual way that you calculate this is by taking for each cell of interest, the row marginal for that, that, that corresponds to that cell, as well as the column marginal, and take the product or multiply those two together, and then divide that by the total sample size. So let's look at an example here. So let's start with that first cell, which is the upper left cell, which is those people who were in the training and those people who were in the training that quit. Okay, so this was 18 people that we actually observed. So how would we, ex we calculate that expected observation or the expected data for that cell? Well, we would take the row marginal, which is 50, times the column marginal that corresponds to that cell, which is 50, multiply those by each other and divide by 100, which represents the total sample size, and we get 25. And then you would repeat this for the other three cells in this two by two matrix here. So that's how we arrive at those expected data or expected values. Okay, so how do we actually calculate a chi-square test of independence? Well, this is one of those instances where it's very useful to actually display the formula here to show what we're actually doing, because it's a really pretty intuitive and simple type of calculation that we're engaging in here. And note that I'm using the Greek notation here for chi-square, which is that X sh shape with the superscript 2. So how do we calculate it? Well, for each cell, we're going to take our observed data value minus our expected data value, square that, and then we're going to divide by the expected data value here. And then we add each one of those for each one of the additional cells. Okay, so let's take a look at that for this example. So for example, if we want to calculate the chi-squared for the, the, the contingency table we were just looking at, we first start with the first cell, 18 minus 25, square that, divided by 25. Then we go to the next cell, 32 minus 25, square that, divided by 25, add then 18 minus 25 squared divided by 25, and then finally add for the last cell, 32 minus 25 squared divided by 25, and we would get a chi-square value of 7.84. Now, we could look at a chi-square distribution table based on the number of degrees of freedom to determine whether that's statistically significant. Fortunately, our statistical software packages today can calculate for this the, the p-value that corresponds to this with great ease and quickness. But so how do we calculate and determine what our actual degrees of freedom are for this type of two by two chi-square test of independence? Well, it's a really simple calculation where degrees of freedom is typically abbreviated as that italicized DF. And so it's simply the number of rows you have minus one times the number of columns minus one. And so for us, that would be two minus one times two minus one, which would equal one. So it just ends up being one times one in this instance. We have a two by two chi-square test of independence. And so that's combined with that chi-square value of 7.84. That's what we're actually using to estimate that p-value. And so in this instance, the chi-square test of independence would be statistically significant because 
a 7.84 chi-square value with degrees of freedom equal to 1 would have a p-value that is less than 0 0.05. So we would reject the null hypothesis that these two categorical variables are independent of one another. In other words, they are dependent upon one another, or in other words, contingent or associated with one another. And so you do need to look back at the actual values themselves to in, then interpret in what direction is that relationship. In this case, it's significant such that those who participated in the training were less likely to quit in their first year. And so how do I know that? Well, let's go back to those observed data right here, the observed values, and you'll see that those people who had the training, uh, there was more people that stayed versus quit. And if you look at those people who, had the, who did not have the training, there was more people who quit than stayed. And so that's how we actually interpret this here. Now, when you get to more chi-square tests that are larger than a two by two, perhaps a two by five, a two by six or so forth, sometimes the interpretation can be a little bit more tricky when it comes to interpreting the direction of the effect. And sometimes we can only really conclude that, well, they don't seem to be independent of one another. In other words, they, they won, Categorical variable seems to be contingent upon the other, or there's some association here, but unpacking the nature of that relationship can be a little bit more challenging. Because remember, categorical variables by nature don't have any order to them. Otherwise, they'd become an ordinal variable. And there is a specific, there's other types of chi-square tests that you can use for ordinal variables. But in this case, if you don't have any order to the different levels or categories within that categorical variable, it can be a little bit more challenging to actually interpret. Okay, so now let's move on to how we actually apply the concept of an effect size and practical significance to a chi-square test of independence, assuming that we found a statistically significant effect. So just remember that a chi-square value in and of itself is not directly interpretable in terms of its magnitude, okay? Which means it's not an effect size. It's not a standardized effect that we can compare between different samples or studies. So if we do want to compute an effect size and determine the practical significance based on a chi-square test and its degrees of freedom, we can compute what's called Cohen's omega. So that little w is the Greek notation for omega. And so this is actually a type of effect size, and then we can compare those Cohen's omegas to determine which one is smaller or greater than another one. And so Cohen offered some general, very general rules of thumb when it comes to actually interpreting effect sizes. And in the case of Cohen's w, the general rules of thumb would be that a small effect is, plot, plot, um, is going to be either positive or negative around 0 0.10, a medium is either positive or negative sign around 0 0.30, and a large is a positive or negative sign around 0 0.50. Okay, and so again, these are rules of thumb, and it'll really depend on the particular scenario, the context, your own organization, in terms of how you'll determine what is practically significant versus not so practically significant, and the degree of practical significance. So, just to sum up quickly, in this lecture we described what a chi-square test of independence is, we talked about the two statistical assumptions underlying a chi-square test of independence. We then moved on and talked about statistical significance and practical significance and effect sizes in the context of a chi-square test of independence. So that wraps up the lecture on chi-square test of independence.